When the first people arrived at Mount Sandal, at the oldest known human site in Ireland, the fact of the big silver salmon swimming past their doorstep can't have failed to be noticed. Such big, tasty and easily caught fish. Such a valuable resource inevitably led to conflict. The O'Cathan clan claimed the west bank of the river, the McQuillan clan claimed the east bank, and the O'Neills held a castle here at Castle Row. Over the centuries, there were various attempts to lease the fishing rights to the river. The rents had a curious structure. They were £10 per year, but £40 per year if the fishing was peaceably enjoyed which meant that although you might have the rights to fish the river, the fact that you might actually get a chance to do it without severe violence getting in the way was not guaranteed. One example was in 1588, when a certain federal O'Cahan was judged by the authorities as a lewd person who was a continuous annoyance to the fishing. A troop of soldiers swam the river and ambushed him in the Cosquin Abbey. His head was sent to Dublin, with the plea that this was obviously a perfectly justifiable approach to the problem. At the time of the plantation, King James declared that he would buy the fishing rights for the new citizens of Northern Ireland. The question was, who owned those fishing rights? The Lord Lieutenant of Ireland discovered that he actually owned them. And so, after several court cases, the fishing rights of the river fell into the hands of the Honourable the Irish Society, who manage the river to this day. As the salmon progress up the river, they start to lose their silver colouring, they lose condition. So it makes sense to harvest them as close to the sea as possible. Just upstream from Coleraine at Castle Row, a huge basalt slab lies across the river. This was, and still is, known as the Salmon Leap. The first cut in the great slab was made in the 17th century to allow logs to be floated down from the great forest of Glen Concane to the port of Coleraine. Its value as a passageway for timber was short-lived, but it was quickly recognised that this could be turned into a valuable fish trap. The technique of fishing at the Crana altered little over the centuries. The net is shot across the river, paid out from the stern of a kobo. It is held in place by the incoming tide, creating a barrier to fish heading upstream. After a time, the end of the net is winched across the river, pulling it into a circle. A team of six men haul the net in hand over hand. The fish are hopefully trapped in the bosom of the net. The traps of the cuts are basically tanks with the river flowing through them. The fish enter through a narrow gap and are trapped. Their instinct to keep travelling upstream is so strong that they do not think to turn around. The water level in the traps is then lowered and the fish are simply netted out. The salmon nets and traps fished on through the centuries with good years and bad years. But in the 1980s, developments in salmon farming meant that the price of salmon began to fall. Wild stocks were dwindling. New conservation measures aimed at defending the wild fish meant that funds were found to buy out the nets and traps and stop them fishing. And so, in the 1990s, the unbelievable happened and the nets and traps of the river ban were closed, perhaps forever.